And like, like Renee said, we do have the same disability we met a few years ago. I felt like I was looking in the mirror because we were just so similar. And um, you don't really see many people with our disabilities. And especially in a small town where I came from, it was just, I was the only little girl in a wheelchair. So everybody had to adapt to me and I had to adapt to them. And it turned out that it was just the best thing that could have happened to my friends, my teachers, as well as for me. So I use my book as a teaching tool that um, diversity is great, no matter what your differences or struggles are, it can be possible for you to be able to do what you need to do. And um, I feel like we have Renee and Dolores and Nancy and all the other advocates for um, our human rights, our civil rights. And I feel like there was nobody there for us when we were younger. So I want to be there. I want to make sure that I'm, I have my little uh, piece of information and education for the younger kids so that they don't have to grow up the way we did. And I feel like accepting each other and yourself has to begin at a very young age, especially if you're born with a disability. And uh, thanks for having me here. And next is Dolores Gonzalez. Good morning, everyone. I'm not going to tell you my age. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was one year old, I contracted polio. And I come from a large family, large Latina family. Uh, my parents came from Mexico City. And um, we actually moved to the United States because of me, because they wanted to get me better assistance. But, um, so I come from a large family. I'm the oldest of nine. And what I always tell people is that, you know, in a Latina family, sometimes you, uh, you wanna take care of your person with a disability. And although they did in their own way, my dad always wanted me to be self-sufficient. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, I grew up with the idea that I was a person who could do things that person couldn't do things. And part of that was that I was in charge. And I mean, as a person with a disability, as a female, Latina, I was in charge. I was in charge of my family. And although the next oldest sibling was a male, they could have said, he's in charge. But they didn't say that. They said, you know, you have to listen to her because she's in charge. So that obviously from a very young age gave me a very uh, a sense of empowerment right away. Since I was the oldest, I went to school first. Um, I didn't know the language, so I had to bring the English back to the house. And so I was the one that was kind of the spearheader <coughs> of the family. And I guess that, like I said, set the pace for, for my life. Um, as a result, uh, I was through the, the then the rehab agency, uh, they paid for my entire schooling. So all my whole, my entire job was to get good grades. If I got good grades, they would pay for my entire schooling, books and everything. So I could not, not take advantage of that. As a result, I became a professional Latina with a disability in the workforce. Now, maybe it's possible that people just, you know, they discriminated against me. I don't know. I always found jobs. I was always able to get a job. I always think that because I was three, three minorities, they didn't know where to, dis, you know, to discriminate. <laughs> where, where did we go? <laughs> and since I made a good interview, then I got the job. So I didn't know what that was like until some part in my early adulthood, I got introduced to uh, the disability movement. When I went to my, that job and my executive director of the Independent Living Center said, do you know about the Rehab Act? Do you know about the Independent Living Movement? I said, I know nothing because it hadn't hit me. But when I was involved, I understood how big of a thing it was and how whatever I had, uh, most people with disabilities didn't have. I got a car at a young age. I was able to go to college. I lived alone. And, and the people in the Independent Living Center, they wanted my life. 
And I finally understood that it was impossible for everybody. And that's when I geared into this field. And we'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I eventually became the ADA coordinator for the city of Austin, which was by far my, my dream job. And uh, a lot of good stories there, but I'll pass it on to my friends at this point. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Dylan. Uh, I got to, I titled this "Empowered Women with Disabilities," and uh, empowerment is unfortunately has become an overused word, but I still like it. So <laughs> I'm keep using it. Uh, anyway, uh, so I'm going to ask my panel here: What does empowerment mean to you, and what makes you an empowered woman, Nancy? Well, first I'm going to tell you what I think, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about this on my way. I'm bringing it up first now. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, when I was driving over here, I was thinking, what is empowerment to me? What does it really mean? And I think for myself, I think it means to stand in your truth. Whatever you believe in, whatever is right for you, then that's what you stand for and that's what you do. And it, it defines your life and it makes you true to everyone else. Not just an example, and I hate the word inspiration, but yes. I think it is possible to inspire people to speak their truth if you can stand in your own truth. So that's what empowerment means to me. Okay, Nancy. Now you just answer. Boy, that's a tough one to follow. <laughs> Um, empowerment means the ability to not take no for an answer. My father taught me that a long time ago because he was in the Army. If you've ever been in the Army, you know, you do things the right way or you get in trouble. Um, in our family, we had five children. I was the only one with a disability. We all had jobs in the house, uh, chores as they used to call them. Well, I couldn't get out of that just because I had a disability. <laughs> no, they modified it for me, luckily. <laughs> I got to fold the wash rags, you know, that was small enough. I got to fold paper bags, I got to chop up vegetables. Anything that I could do, they would make me do. And I did a lot. <laughs> but it gave me the sense of I can do it. Because I didn't say no, I wasn't about to. That was my dad. Um, but what also it occurred to me is that people will say no to me. A lot. As we, I was growing up, um, we didn't have transportation, accessible transportation to school. I have to tell you, one of the most hilarious things I'd ever seen, but because we wouldn't take no for an answer, they decided my means of transportation to school, public school, would be an ambulance. <laughs> An ambulance because it was accessible. The only reason it was accessible is because it had two strong men in it. <laughs> um, and it had lights. <laughs> and the standard operating procedure was if you're loading or unloading, you get to turn on the lights. <laughs> And everybody got to know when I arrived to school <laughs> and when I left school. <laughs> now, you want to know about empowerment? <laughs> everybody loved it. And I thought, well, it doesn't get me any dates, but it certainly gets me a lot of attention. <laughs>
I said, well, okay. And I talked to my uh, counselor. It used to be Texas Rehab then. Talked to my counselor and they said, no, no, you can't go. I said, why? <laughs> my friends are going. <laughs> And what happened was, is he felt that I wouldn't be able to handle it. Little did he know, I had gone ahead and applied behind his back. Don't tell me no, because I'll do it anyway. I would rather face a disappointment myself than have someone tell me no. I got accepted. And in the day of computers, yes, there was a day before computers. <laughs> I actually got accepted three times to the University of Texas at Austin. <laughs> and there history began. <laughs> and that, I will tell you, is empowerment. When there are more than two gathered, in the disability field, as we were, um, that's a lot of empowerment. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Nancy. Angel? Well, uh, my empowerment, of course, came, like I said, in different stages of my childhood. But I think the most empowering uh, experience I ever had was um, getting pregnant and becoming a mom. Um, I have a 24-year-old daughter, just graduated from UT with her master's in higher education and leadership policy. Yes. And I think that that's probably because I always told her not to give up. When I was graduating high school, it was in 89, I chose not to go to college because I wanted to get married and I wanted to have a family. And uh, to me, that was important. Later, after I had her, I was afraid of CPS knocking on my door saying, you know, I don't think you can take care of your child. But I made myself do everything that I could for her. I changed her diapers, I fed her, clothed her, everything. The only thing I didn't do and ask for help with was bathing her because I was afraid to get her out of the tub but I did do everything for her. I couldn't do it for all for myself, but I could do it for her. And um, she grew up, and well, as a little girl, I remember walking her around our neighborhood. And of course we lived in a small town too, but at, as, as a toddler, she would hold on to the armrest of my chair or my hand, whatever. Never ran out into the street. She just had that understanding that this is not what you were supposed to do. I never did spank her either, except for once probably because she threw a fit on the floor and I just thought, we just can't do that in public. I'll never pick her up. So I had to teach her really, really early not to throw a tantrum. But um, other than that, she would just, she had very much, very much, uh, great patience because I had to do everything for her. It was a little bit slower. Um, she has a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion. And I think that just comes from having to later on help me pick up things from the floor, cook sometimes. Um, she wouldn't touch the hot stuff, but she'd help me get things and everything. And um, she grew up to be a very remarkable young woman. Um, and I think that I did that, you know, and I'm so proud of that. That was my most empowering feeling I've ever felt. Still do. I just look at her and I feel it. And I look at her and I see the beauty of what she's, what she still has yet to become. She's going to be an exceptional mother. And, um, that's just, you know, my absolute Thank you. So my, my most significant uh, sense of empowerment was when I was 16, uh, my dad came to me and said, you know, I'm going to buy a new car, and so my old car is going to be your car. And 
I want you to go figure out how to take driver's ed with the, the hand controls. So I needed hand controls. And he says, and you need to figure out where we're gonna get the hand controls. I'll pay for them, but you need to figure all of this out. <laughs> so, you know, you can see from that example that he was an empowering person. And he wanted me to go figure everything out. And he says, once you take the driver's ed, I'll take you out driving, but you, know, you need to go and do all of that first. And of course, I was the only person in my class who had, you know, had to order, had to request uh, a car with hand controls. And everybody except for me had driven some in you know, their parents' car, whatever bicycles, I had no concept of any of that. And so I was hitting the curves and I had no concept for, for depth perception, nothing. So I had to learn all that. But anyway, um, when he told me he was getting me this car, he says, I'm giving you your independence because you know I don't want you to depend on anybody. And I used to take the school bus to, to, to school but, um, but now I had my car. Now I had the car and he says, but you're gonna be responsible. You're gonna tell me when it needs work. You're gonna tell me, you know, I, I will put all the gas and I'll do all of that, but you're still responsible. You're also responsible that you need to take your mother because she doesn't drive, your mother anywhere she needs to go and your brothers where they need to go. <laughs> my seven brothers at the time. <laughs> <laughs> So I became like the family taxi, but you know, ultimately, I I got to know I was from El Paso. I got to know El Paso really well, and and I did because of that. It, it taught me how to drive well, how to get around, and you know, I mean, that was significant for me in terms of being being empowered. So. I told you the story when I started with the Independent Living Center, and I, I didn't have a disability-related job, because my, 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 uh, my profession was accounting, so I was doing budgetary work for the Independent Living Center. But of course, if you're in the Independent Living Center, they're gonna, they're gonna envelop you into the whole thing. I didn't know that was gonna happen to me, but it did. Now, I had an office that was Outside, I didn't actually have an office. I had an old cubicle. And people that were coming for services would come and talk to me. And this one guy, one time, he was telling me sort of a little bit of his story. And he was always really meticulously well-dressed and, and so forth. And he came often to the, to the center. But he tells me that he never picks out his clothes. He doesn't have any control over his money because his family would just kind of take his money, his social security money, and they just dole out some little money to him. And so the truth is, he really wasn't independent. Now, he was one of the people that told me, I want your, what you have. And until that happened to me, that, that he did that, I didn't know how empowered I had been, how empowered to make the decisions, what choices I went for college, what things I did, what, you know, just what extracurricular activities, how much of that is really freedom sometimes to people with disability that I didn't know that some people did not have. So I really felt lucky that, you know, through the experience of my family and the empowering that my dad started and that other people, other mentors, teachers, and so forth, that how much that actually did for me to be empowered and how much how important it was to have the ability to make the decisions for your life. Thank you, Dean. Uh, one of the things that we uh, talked about right before we got started today was about role models. And uh, uh, just to tell you my own story, uh, I didn't have a lot of role models growing up. I had, um, <clears throat> Because most of the people that I knew who had disabilities were actually were being taught not to ask for anything. They were being taught that they couldn't do anything. They were, you know, they were being taught to be very passive. And I didn't want to be that way. And uh, so I credit my mother. I think, I think she's my role model because my mother never, ever let me get away with saying I can't do it. <clears throat> my story is that one time, 
I was trying to learn how to write and I must have been in first grade or second grade and I was having difficulty trying to figure out how to hold a pencil and how to write. And my first grade teacher, special ed teacher, because at the time we were all in special ed, I, they didn't care what your disability was, any disability, and you were put in special education. So I was in my special ed class and my teacher, Ms. Brazil, uh, said, you know what, don't worry about it. You, you probably won't ever have to write anyway, so don't worry. So I went home and my mother told me to sit down, I had a little kid's table and, and it was time for me to practice writing. And I said, oh, mom, I don't have to write because Ms. Brazil said I didn't have to, that I wouldn't have to. And she said, in part of my language, my mother, my she said, I don't give a damn what Ms. Brazil said. You are gonna write. Pick up that pencil and you're gonna practice. And I practiced and practiced and I ended up with beautiful handwriting on some of them. And uh, this was before typing too. <laughs> you have to learn how to write and you have to learn cursive. Um, so, and my mom, uh, even though we clashed and there were times I was, you know, would get really angry, I, with her, uh, she never ever let me get away with anything. She uh, said, you can do it. You may have to do it differently, but you can do it. And uh, so I give her all the credit for pushing me, because if she hadn't pushed me, I would have found it very easy to lay down on that couch and just be watching TV and wouldn't be doing anything with my life. Um, the other thing though, I one role model that I did have was Helen Keller. Uh, see, I had to go into a book to read about somebody with a disability who overcame obstacles. And the fact that she went to college uh, gave me the inspiration, I'm sorry for that word again, uh, that I could do it too. And for that reason, I kept, when I went to UT, which is how I met Nancy, uh, I thought to myself, well, Helen Keller can do it, you know, come on, I can do it too. So, um, slowly I became, I think we realized when we were talking that we almost had to become our own role models. Because at the time that we were growing up, there really weren't that many people with disabilities that had broken barriers. And um, so, anyway, Nancy, tell your role model story. <laughs> and no, you can't use me as an example. <laughs> I taught her everything she knows. <laughs> I want to tell you though, um, growing up, and I guess you can figure out that I'm not a, a Latino background, I'm a German background. So if I speak loudly and robust, that's the German in me. We adopted you, Nancy. Yes, gracias. She's an honorary Mexican. <laughs> I want to let you know that uh, going through special ed, I was like uh, the most perfect kid ever, but I had this wheelchair thing, and it was before there was mainstreaming in schools. I was like, wow, am I already, am I going to spend all my life in this classroom? Well, they just started mainstreaming, and I was the first kid ever in our school to be mainstreamed, which meant that I got to go to the normal classes. The only uh, accommodation I needed was someone to help push my wheelchair to the next classes or to lunch or whatever. I met a gajillion students that wanted to do that. You know why? Because they got out of class early. <laughs> and it was fun. We used to run down the halls. They would jump on back of my chair. We'd go sailing by other classrooms. It was great. I was a big menace when I was a little kid. <laughs> well, even today. Um, the other thing that I noticed as a mentor, of course, like the like Renee said, there wasn't anybody to really mentor us. I think we just had it within us what we wanted to do. But I used to watch this show called Ironside. It had to do with a police officer who was shot and paralyzed. And he was in an electric wheelchair oh my god 
Oh. <laughs> it was the beginning of the life. <laughs> that was my mentor, a guy on TV in an electric wheelchair. Guess what else he could do? He could drive. <laughs> oh my God! It was possible to drive if you were in a wheelchair. It was on TV and that was real, right? <laughs> <laughs> what? Stop with that, you're going to break glasses. <laughs> I broke records. Let me put it this way. After I got into college, one of the um, things I did after I graduated was I learned to drive. I had a uh, huge vehicle I learned to drive. I, I had no clue, just like Dolores. Curbs, ramps, stopping, going. The worst thing was learning how to parallel park. I am the best parallel parker because I have my dad teach me how. But um, that was some of those challenges that you go through. And it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. I learned this because the guy on TV was in a wheelchair. And then I came to Austin, and oh my God, there was everybody in a wheelchair, <laughs> at least more than one. And this is where I started to learn about the community and, and role models, real role models, not the ones on TV. These were real people with real lives. And it was such a blessing to come to Austin and to meet so many different people with so many different disabilities and to learn that there is a way to live with role models. Next. Thank you. <laughs> Angel. Well, um, like Renee and Nancy, our, our parents were our role models. Like I said, uh, when I was in school, there, I was the only little girl in a wheelchair till I graduated, I think. I think there was a boy that was a little older than me. But um, I couldn't, you know, imitate anybody else. I had to figure out how to do everything on my own from the very beginning. Um, later on, though, and, you know, this is what I think about. It's so great living in a small town. We have that closeness where everybody... They, they not only know you and can know everything about you, but they know enough about you to help you and to tell you and to help you get you exactly what you need. Um, but I was always in the classroom, though. <laughs> That's one good thing about it, too. There wasn't an extra special ed classroom for me at all. I was always in there. So... Um, with everybody else. But later on, you know, in and as early as 2013 is where I came across all these other people with wheelchairs. And it just, it was like a flood. It was so overwhelming. And our stories were so similar. Some were worse than mine. And growing up, you know, with me being the only friend in a wheelchair, I just thought, that's impossible. Who could have it worse? Well, there were lots that had it worse. Those are my role models. I learned from them. Um, and I still do. Um, these ladies here on the panel and others that have been with us on the panel have been such heroes to me. And uh, all my ADAPT friends as well. There's one right there. I love them so much because um, they're there because we're here and able to do things like this because of them and because of these ladies here as well. And those are my role models. I don't have one in particular. I have them as a group. And, um, but without them, I wouldn't be where I am right now. I would not have tried to compete for Ms. Wheelchair Tech. I would not be as big an advocate as I am right now because a long time ago I was just doing it for myself 
And now I see the importance of doing it for everybody else. And it's because of them. So I'm so lucky and blessed to have them. I'm blessed to have my disability. And a lot of people wouldn't understand that, but I can't see myself as any other, in any other way. And um, I think that the more I am in contact with more people with different types of disabilities, the better off I feel in my position because I am just like them, they are just like me. And together we can be there for each other. And I, I just love that. So those are my, my role models. Thank you. So I, I've had a, a, a good number of people throughout my life that have encouraged me, that have encouraged me to do better more. But when I entered into the disability arena, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time, literally, <laughs> to get the job that I got, because the reality is that I didn't compete for my job. I was just appointed because the person that I was reporting to at the time said, you're going to be good for this job. So, I, you know, I was very lucky. Divinely guided is what I say. But as part of that, um, one time I got a chance to meet what I consider to be one of my role models for the disability community, which was Justin Dart. I don't know if you all know Justin yeah. Dart, but Justin was what we considered the father of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And he also had polio, so we kind of shared that. And one particular year, uh, the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, who is sponsoring, part sponsoring this conference, they have their conference and it moves around and so forth. And it was going to be in San Antonio, and I was going to go, and I wanted to help out, so I went early. I get there, and the executive director says, we need somebody to go pick up Justin at the airport. And he doesn't want a, a wheelchair-accessible vehicle. He just wants a regular car. Who wants to go? <laughs> I want to go. <laughs> this man was sort of like a celebrity in the disability community, and wherever he went, blocks of people would flock to him. So I've seen him before, but I had never gotten close enough to him. So here I go. I'm picking him up by myself in my little car. And, and so, you know, there I go. And I'm there. And this is before, I think it was before 9-11. So they sort of let me park there, but they were kind of trying to shoot me. And I'm like, I'm waiting for someone who used a wheelchair. So I need to stay right here. And I couldn't go get him. And so anyway, he, he gets in the car. He was late. He gets in the car, and, uh, and it's just me and him driving back. And so he just starts to ask me about what I do for a living and what's going on and a little bit about my life. And I really felt, you know, like he really cared about knowing about me. And so part of our conversation was that he was going to deliver a speech. And the other thing about him was that he was a very powerful speaker. His voice carried and he was just a very powerful speaker. And we were in San Antonio, so he says, I want to say, uh, he says, do you know Spanish? And I go, yeah. And he says, I want to say, uh, together we shall overcome in Spanish. And I said, okay, well, juntos venceremos. <clears throat> and so he was saying it and saying it and saying it until he felt comfortable to say it powerfully. And so, you know, so I went and I took him back to the hotel and sure enough, as soon as we arrived, a flock of people, and there he was whisked away, and I didn't see him again. And then, of course, he delivered his speech, and, and he, he ended it with this, juntos venceremos. So, you know, I really felt uh, empowered by him, and, and he was, he lived up to the role model <laughs> situation. And <laughs> you were here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, most of us here, well, all of us here, have had a profession that had an impact on people with disabilities. Uh, I will just tell a little bit about myself. I worked for 30 years for the state, uh, which sounds really boring, and uh, it pretty much was. But anyway, um, <laughs> but I'll tell you that when I started working, it was with about 300, maybe 600 other people. 
and it was with the Disability Determination Services for Social Security Administration. I was so happy to have a job because nobody would hire me. I had a master's degree. I thought that would help me at least get my foot in the door, but they would take one look at me and say, I can't do it. I even had one person tell me, one person who interviewed me tell me, you need to go home and just stay with your parents, okay? Don't try to work. Why would you want to work? You can stay home and get, get a disability check. Well, I had a lot of pride and so did my parents and my parents were not gonna let me stay home and get a disability check. Uh, they said, you can get a job, you're very smart, you've got your degrees, you know, you can do it, you're just gonna have to persist. You're gonna have to break down those walls. So I went after job interview, after job interview, after job interview, it must've been uh, probably, it seemed like a long time, like a year and a half, but I've known people who've gone five years without getting a job. So eventually I got hired and I had one guy, kind of a good old boy, say to me, I guess you're worth taking a chance on. And so I said, okay, thanks. You know. uh, so I started working for the state and I became really good at my job. I was the first person there. I think I worried a lot of people about uh, what kind of help is she gonna need. I felt like an insect under a microscope, honestly, when I first started working there. Because everybody was just watching me to see is she going to fail? Is she going to fail? Can she do the job? And uh, well, anyway, eventually I proved myself and to the point where I became a trainer and actually taught the programs and policies to the new people who were hired. And I made a lot of friends along the way. So it was really a very, very good experience. Uh, anyway, the uh, Nancy. Uh, is going to talk about the changes she made in transportation working for Capital Metro. And we're running out of time, so go ahead and make it quick. <laughs> <clears throat> well, when I was younger, <laughs> so I, I think I've already gave, given some examples of how I've had trouble with transportation all my life. When I went to UT, I was even involved in a, a lawsuit against the university <coughs> because their shuttle buses were not accessible. And that pretty much uh, made people with disabilities have to live on campus. And it restricted our um, mainstreaming in, into the community while we were students. So you get the drift. I, I was a little ticked. Um, so actually not knowing that my social work degree would lead me to transportation, um, I got involved with a group called ADAPT, who are my brothers and sisters in crime, uh, I mean in empowerment, <laughs> most of the time, and uh, they really taught me a lot about the needs for accessible transportation. Of course, I came from a small town, we knew about buses, but after I graduated from UT and I learned about uh, Capital Metro, and I had all the encouragement of my brothers and sisters with ADAPT, um, I applied for a position over there. No, not as a driver. <laughs> I'm sorry, a lot of people go, were you a driver? <laughs> no, I was the ADA coordinator, and I got to implement all the regulations having to do with transportation. And that went from lifts on buses to wheelchair securement devices to driver training. I know I'm trying to hurry up. Uh, <laughs> but there was a lot to my job. There's a lot to job. <laughs> I just wanna I just want to put it succinctly that all the buses are accessible, all the fixed routes are accessible. They have ramps. Anybody in the wheelchair can get on the bus and ride anywhere in this town and it's because Thank of this Um, actually, we were wondering if we could just take questions on our own, like during lunch, or... Oh, that's yeah. 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 Oh, oh, good. Lunch, but I'm sorry. Oh, okay. We have 15 minutes right now, so we're going to have to stop. Okay. So I guess we'll keep them, so if you guys want to come up and ask questions. Yeah. Okay, okay. they can come up and ask questions, but I just want to end it with one. I was just going to ask one thing. Mm -hmm. 
and I want to bring to an end. I'm sorry. Uh, and Nancy, <laughs> anyway, one thing that uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask the panel to say was, if you could say one thing to help other people uh, become advocates, it would be this. And uh, for me, it would be find your voice. I remember when I started uh, wanting to be an advocate, Nancy was my role model. And uh, I'm trying to keep her humble, so I, mean, I don't like you know say that too often. But anyway, I kept saying, God, I wish I could be like you, Nancy, and just speak up. And she goes, you yeah, will, sister, just you, you'll find your voice. So that would be, be my advice to the, the younger people is you will find your voice. Find your voice and learn to be an advocate. Okay, Angel? Self-acceptance is my thing. Um, as you can see, I wear heels. I like to dress up. <laughs> if you look good, you feel good and you do good. That's all I gotta say. So I don't know that I can add to anything else, but I think that um, find others like you. You know, uh, even when I came to Austin, I didn't know a lot of people, but I got myself connected to the people in the disability community. And little did I know that that actually was one of the main reasons I got my job was because I was connected to the disability community. Uh, Nancy, did you have one word you'd like to say? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It's a long word. <laughs> be loud, be yeah. proud. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We'll take a couple of questions. We're not going to take a couple of questions. Can I just make one announcement? Okay, sorry. Um, just quick, um, we want to uh, take a picture with the three or four wonderful ladies. Uh, just FYI, I used to call my role models. <laughs> um, so if everybody wants to come up here, like kind of like we did last time, and uh, take a picture with them. Um, and I'm just going to make an announcement about our next session. So we're going to try to break for like about 10 minutes. And then um, at 11 or so, we're going to start the next session. That is going to be a, a breakout like yesterday. So we're going to have one session here, um, and that's going to be uh, neuro neurodiversity and organizational strategy, right there. Yeah. And that's with Sara Serrano. And then in the Elm room, we're going to have uh, Diego Guerra with uh, community and disability. And that will be um, at 11. But please come up here so we can take a picture with these four wonderful uh, women uh, of and wheels. <laughs> My wheel <laughs> <Magnolia>, is sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.